Hawthorne Edward Welcher Jr. And I'm Tamisha Kenlock Carter. Good morning, Beulah Grove. These are our announcements and upcoming events. Attention, Beulah Grove. The Worship Arts Ministry is seeking participants for our candlelight communion service in December. If interested, contact Minister Kevin Staley at ksaley at beulahgrove.org. The Golden Ages Thanksgiving Luncheon will be held at the Resource Center on Wednesday, November 20th at 10 a.m. Please make a note that the Beulah Grove campus will be closed on November 28th and 29th in observance of the Thanksgiving holiday. The Resource Center is requesting food donations to assist with the restocking the pantry. We are in need of several food items to include meats, canned goods, and non-perishable items. Please contact the Resource Center for more details at the number shown. We send our heartfelt sympathy to all of those who experience this loss and sorrow during this time. In moments of grief, it is important to always remember that you are not alone. Our thoughts and our prayers are always with you. These have been your morning announcements. Thank you for worshiping with us on today. Please make sure you hit the subscribe button. Good morning, church. It's always a good feeling to be back in, in person or virtual. Glad you're here.
is not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. this wheel. Is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord one more time? You look good. You look like God has been good to you. Can we stand all across the building as we do? Our 
him this morning. Come on, clap your hands. It just says at the cross. Let's start verse one.
Good morning. There we go. Thank you, Lord. Good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome to our worship service today. I am Sonia Williams, and I'm grateful to lift the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ up with you this morning. On behalf of our pastor, Reverend Xavier Kriegmer, his wife, Dr. Chandra Kriegmer, and their family, we are delighted to share in worship with you today. We pray that this worship experience encourages your faith, strengthens your relationship with Christ, and in the fellowship of love with one another. We also pray that this worship carries each of us from day to day to day to day to day and other days to come, right? Let us also remember to consider the safety for not only ourselves, but for those that are around us. As we all know here at Beulah Grove, we are G3. So let us continue to grow together from generation to generation as the Lord our God continues to lead us forward. God bless each and every one of you and have an awesome week in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for this truly is the day that the Lord has made, and we have every reason to rejoice and be glad in it. I, I said, this is the day, not a day that you made, not a day that you woke yourself up, not a day that you even knew was going to come about for you that the Lord has made, and we all ought to rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, yeah. Thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. We are so grateful and glad that we serve a God who is great and greatly to be praised. I greet you on this Lord's Day. We are thankful to God that we are gathered together in the house of worship, and we are excited about the fact that we can worship the Lord our God. I don't know about you, but I have been through too much not to worship him. He's been there every step of the way with me, and I know he's been there with you. And if you made it through this week, you got a reason to worship him. As we're here to worship him today, allow me to share a few announcements very quickly and get out of your way that we can continue to forget of ourselves and concentrate on him and worship him. Uh, we have coming up some great uh, things that were across the campus and allow me to say that the Golden Agers group that's been meeting over at the Resource Center, we're excited about them sharing in their Thanksgiving luncheon. Those who are from Beulah Grove and others that share in that experience, that Wednesday bingo time and fellowship that's so great and tremendous over there. Uh, the Thanksgiving luncheon will be on Wednesday, November 20th at 10 a.m. Those we look forward to sharing with and celebrating uh, the time and fellowship that has been developed over the years over this. We thank God for those who will be preparing the food and serving the food to our golden ages during that time. Also, our health care ministry workshop has been rescheduled for Saturday, November 23rd from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's uh, for this, th this Saturday coming up from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Now, if you have want more information, please see Dr. Barbara Welcher for information. Amen. Amen. Also, uh, the season to adopt a senior is coming up soon. We we do adopt a senior. We've done it for years, and we thank God for how it's been a blessing tremendously. Uh, we ask that you would uh, pre, uh, get the, uh, the information. Uh, from the resource center um, and they'll tell you about what you need to do and there's usually a $25 gift card that we get for our seniors so we thank you in advance for those who will participate with this ongoing blessing and gifting to our seniors. Also, uh, our poinsettia sales will begin today, uh, excuse me, next Sunday, November 24th, poinsettias. We are right there at Advent and Christmas already. Can you believe it? Man, this year has gone by fast. And if you've been out in these streets, you see people shopping like Christmas is tomorrow. Amen. So we're, we're excited, though. We see that we're good to uh, prepare to uh, participate in this amazing and blessed experience of where we uh, provide the poinsettias here. And this is a part of our memorial ministry. 
um, the Deacon Mobley and the Memorial Ministry. We do this as an opportunity to raise money so that we can continue to provide scholarships moving forward in our future. We're really excited to see that happen for 2025. Also, please be aware that the phone number for our prayer line, the prayer line that people call in on Sundays and when we call in during the week, that prayer line has a new number. That new, new number is, if you want to write it down, or if you want to call the church this week, we'll make sure you get it. But it's 706-724-3518. 706-724-3518. We've had to make some adjustments. We've had to get some things updated in the church. And sometimes that means you have to change some of the numbers because some of the things that technology has required of us had to make those things change so that we could make sure we could be effective in our communication. So that's just an updated number, still the same prayer line, and it's still served by those who are part of the prayer ministry, which we thank God for them. Also, we're still collecting additional food items uh, for the Resource Center Pantry. We thank God for the Resource Center and how we continue to provide, and that being the ongoing seven-day-a-week missional arm of the church. The church together, we all participate in missions, amen? I know we have a missions ministry, but they're just there to give leadership to the missional efforts of the church. The church is always missional. That is about serving others, providing for others, caring for others. That is a part of who we are. And I thank you, Beulah Grove, for being faithful to doing mission. Give God praise for yourselves. Thank you for those who have been bringing the canned goods and bringing things to help uh, restock our pantry. And we know that we're in that need. I know many have needs, but we also want to think sacrificially to help others because we've had the hurricane that came our way and it took everything off our shelves to help serve others. And we thank you for those who are helping replenish those shelves by bringing some canned goods, bringing some non-perishables that are being availed. And we thank God also because I got a text message just yesterday of another opportunity from outside of Augusta of those who want to bring some resources to help us. So we thank God for the continued efforts that come our way. Amen. Also, we continue to extend our deepest sympathy to those who have experienced losses. We're praying with you. There are a couple of funerals coming up this week. Please uh, pay attention to your emails. Your emails will inform you about those upcoming funerals and uh, homegoing celebrations. Really, there's one on Friday, and there'll be one on Saturday late afternoon. So we ask that you, Beulah Grove, still show up. Let's be there for those who are grieving and those who are going through. Let's be there to uplift them in song, lift them in prayer. Uplift them by your presence because you don't know when you'll be in that place when you're mourning and you're sorrowed and sad and you're looking for those who say that they're your brothers and sisters in Christ to be here with you. So as we would desire for ourselves, we also should do for one another. Amen? Amen. Also, thank you, thank you, thank you. We have accomplished a great goal with our YouTube, as we shared, that we're going to be using that to become a vital resource in how we share and serve. But we have moved past the 1,000-person mark for those subscribed. Amen? And here's where our challenge is. We've crossed the 1,000-person mark. We have 1,000 subscribers to our YouTube page. Share it with others. Let it be a blessing. Let's encourage others to be able to stay connected because we look forward to doing things through that experience to begin to share the word, to minister in new ways and, and move forward as we continue to progress the church together. Lastly, we thank God for our, our children and youth uh, church team. We thank God for them. They meet on second and fourth Sundays. I know some say, well, what Sunday they meet? They meet on second and fourth Sundays. Amen. The other times we're together because our children on first Sundays are here leading us in worship and in song and praise. Amen. And they do such a wonderful job, don't they? Amen. Let's give God praise for them. Also, they're in their church on second and fourth Sundays, but third Sunday, we all come together. Why? Because that's communion time. Amen. That's a time where we should be together, where we should share. So our children, as they grow in their faith, they understand 
the, what we do when we come to the table, when we take of the bread and the wine and uh, as the sacraments that represent the body of Christ and we take those together as one. So I thank you for allowing this uh, to go forth in the way we are and the trusting that God is ministering to us all in everything that we do. And I challenge you this week to keep on sharing the good news of Jesus with somebody else. Amen. Share the good news. Don't keep it to yourself. Because if he's been good to you, don't think that he can't be good to your neighbor. Don't think he can't be good to that one on your job that gets on your last nerve. Don't think that he can't show up and show out in ways that you never would have expected. So I dare you this week to go out and share that Jesus is real to you. Amen. 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 Once again, I'm Deacon Larry Rams. I'm here to do, do the prayer. And I'm asking everybody to close your eyes and think about the goodness of God. Amen. Just close your eyes and let's think on the goodness of God, what he have done for us. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, let me first say thank you. Thank you, Father God, because you woke us up this morning. Oh, Father God, you woke us up clothed in our right mind. And then, Father God, we had the activities of our limbs, Father God. Oh, Father God, it may, may have took a second or two, but we moved around, Father God, and we said thank you. And then when we woke up and looked around, we saw our family was still okay, Father God. We thank you for that right now. And then, Father God, you was gracious enough to let us come down here, Father God. Oh, Father God, we thank you for that also. Then, Father God, let me ask you right now. Touch somebody right now. Somebody's body is aching with pain. Somebody's head is hurting. Somebody's limbs are hurting right now, Father God. Oh, Father God, somebody got cancer. Somebody may have diabetes. Somebody just may not know what to do in this moment. But we ask you to touch them right now. Move with them right now as only you can, Lord God. Knowing all powers in your hand. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time right now, Father God. We thank you for this day, a day we have never seen and never see again. Oh, Father God, I ask you to bless right now. Bless our pastor and his family right now. Lift him up where he may be weak on any leaning corner, Father God. Lift him and trust him and use him, Father God, for his word for us, Father God. And then we ask you to touch his wife and his family also, Father God in their life right now, Father God. Matter of fact, Lord, touch every family in this place right now, Father God. And then we thank you for that right now, Father God. And then, Father God, let me go on to say, touch leadership. Oh, Father God, touch leadership right now, Father God, wherever it may be, Father God, locally or nationally, Father God. Move as only you can, Father God. Lord, Father God, because we are trusting you. Our hope is in you, not our leaders, Father God. And Father God, we thank you for that right now. And then, Father God, I ask you right now, Father God, to touch our children, Father God. Touch them, Father God. Touch their families, Father God. Move on them right now, Father God, as only you can, Father God. And we thank you for that also, Father God. Touch the bereaved, sick, and shed in also, Father God. Oh, Father God, let them know all powers in your hand. You make no mistakes, Father God. Everything has a reason, Father God. Let me say a special blessing to Chris. Touch his body as he go through operation through this week, Father God. Touch him right now from his head down to his feet, Father God. And then give everybody wisdom who may come in this room, Father God. Touch the doctors, the nurse, even the janitor, Father God. Let them all come in with wisdom and grace, Father God. We thank you for that right now. Oh, Father God, and then let me not, let me not be selfish, Father God. Bless me, Father God. Teach me. Show me what you would have me to do, Father God. Oh, Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you right now, Father God. Oh, Father God, we thank you, praise you, and honor you. In Jesus Christ's most powerful and righteous name, let everybody say amen, amen, and amen. Worship where we worship the Lord our God in giving. 
it is giving time and we give generously because we have received generously. We give gratefully because we have received gratefully. We give to the glory of God because he deserves all the glory. Let us then give generously with an attitude of gratefulness that we may glorify the Lord our God together. Please pay attention to the screen so that you may see the various ways to where you can participate during this particular segment of worship. And to our visitors desiring to contribute to today's offering, please raise your hands and a trustee will come to you.
let us pray. Oh God, we thank you today. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you. We thank you, Lord, because your mercy endures forever and ever. And Lord, as we worship you in giving, bless the offering that has been given. Sanctify, Lord, in, in your holy name. And Lord, we ask that you use it to advance and expand your kingdom. Bless all of those who gave, Lord, and continue to bless us in such a way that we will continue to support the work here at Beulah Group. Now sanctified in your love is our prayer. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray and give it all to you. Let every heart say amen, amen. Don't stop praising him now. Because if you know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, no one can come to the Father except through him. You ought to praise him because he made a way for us. Amen. Would you bow in prayer with me? We can't stop thanking you enough for your saving work in our lives. To know that such a deliverance has come for us by faith. That assures us that even where we are right now, that this is not it. And even though we're in days that are uncertain, days we're not sure of how tomorrow will be. We don't face these things. We don't face these moments. We don't have these questions that don't have an answer. Because our answer is Jesus through and through it all. As long as we have that answer, we will live. As long as we have that answer, we will walk by faith and not by sight. As long as we have that answer, we don't get troubled by trying times. Because we know that ultimately the victory is ours through him. And now as we come to the time of preaching, to keep us in that course instead, I pray for this word, O oh God. That you speak to me and through me. That these your people might hear and live according to the example that you, Jesus, have given us of how to walk in this world and even in this season of life that we now experience. It's in Jesus' name I pray. We love you, Lord, and thank you. Let's all say together, amen, 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 amen. If you don't mind joining me, Mark chapter 10. Uh, verses 35 through 45, Mark 10, 35 through 45. And we want to say thank you again to Reverend Julius Johnson, who shared on last week on Veterans Day with us and preaching the word. And we were grateful to have him back home. And we thank God for him and where God is leading and guiding his life right now. We thank God for you for being faithful to hear the word and to receive the word and allow the word to take its root in your heart. The seed truly was scattered on last Sunday to be able to help us to grow according to that which God gave to the preacher. So we thank God indeed for him. And we thank God again for this time of preaching on this morning. And we invite you again, Mark 10, 35 through 45. If you don't have the scripture, uh, it should be on the screen and you can read along from there. The word of God says to us in these verses, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. And they said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. With the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard it, they became indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, 
and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For well, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. One, I want to preach from this subject. Don't let this be you. Don't let this be you. As followers of Jesus Christ, we don't realize how in our attempts to be and do great things, our requests that we make of the Lord are often far from the revelation that we have of him in the word. If you don't believe me, just ask James and John, the sons of Zebedee. These two brothers who in Mark's gospel are always introduced as the sons of Zebedee have from their family of origin an air of privilege attained, uh, attached to them. That this privilege is attached to them because it seems that it could only be this that would make them so bold and brash to approach Jesus and ask him to do what they want him to do. I, I don't know about you, but it, it takes something to, there to go to Jesus and say, we want you to do what we want. Not we want to do your will, but we want you to do what we ask you to do. Must be something that would cause them to even think that they could come together in such a way and make such a request of Jesus. And even Matthew offers to us that it's their mother who goes on their behalf. And she goes on their behalf to make the request of Jesus. That means that there's perhaps this air of privilege that was not first informed by them, although it shows up in them, but perhaps it's something that's in their family. When we think about that, we realize that some people today who don't even realize that they operate in privilege are not in that place or not in that experience, just of themselves now. But mama, daddy, grandma, grandpa, allow them to think that they could operate in this way and that's why they're still ignorant of it. Mark, however, as he introduces their conduct, he presents us their lofty ambitions. These ambitions that appear to be clothed in their privilege brings us into a place of considering that privilege is not so much about the color of skin, it's not about the position in life, it's not about the identity of the ones who hold it. Privilege is actually a power grab. It's a desire to have dominance and dominion. And when we consider what's ultimately at play in privilege, it's something that many of us may not admit it, but all of us want something of privilege for ourselves from it. I know that hit us hard, didn't it? Because all of us want to be in control. All of us want things to work out the way we want them to. We want to be the ones that call the shots. We want to be the ones that have the authority to tell somebody else what to do and when to do it. All of us want what privilege we give. And as we have seen it play out on the stage of our world today, through insults hurled, racial diversity being attacked, the mockery of how people were brought up, and even the comedy that became more tragic than the entertainment that it was supposed to bring about in the political spectrum. All of societal ills were showing up upon the political stage that we just all experienced. We saw the worst in people. 
We saw some, some bad things happen, some awful colored words that we were just shocked to hear and could not believe that people would say right in front of our very eyes. And we saw privilege play out. But it wasn't just party of privilege. It was parties of privilege. It wasn't just certain people who operated from privilege, but there were others who were grabbing and grasping to get what privilege would give. And, and we have to know that this is a reality, not just for us, but it's even in our text because Jesus does not just talk to James and John, but he talks to all 12 of the disciples because he realized that even in their anger towards James and John, that they too had an issue deep in their hearts that was exposing them. And I want you to know today, saints of God, that, that where we see this reality in the text, where we have experienced this reality in the world, that we must heed what Jesus says. He says, don't let this be you. He, he says, don't, don't let Notoriety. Don't let fame, don't let authority and positions get the better of you thinking this is how you're supposed to live. He says that, that we should not appear in any form or fashion to grasp for what privilege suggests. Jesus says that, 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 no, you should not allow this to be how you function, how you exist, how you begin to come into this experience of life. Because if you follow me, you can't hold on to that while I lead you. And even if we consider this then, that as Jesus addresses with the disciples and presents this to us through the text, Jesus, if anything, had every right to be angry at the 12 response, it should, it would, should be the same way with us. Because Jesus has just told them for the third time about his death. He, he had just told them that he was to be handed over, mocked, spit on, flogged, and killed, and in three days he arrived. He just informed them for the third time, but yet their focus is not on what he's doing for them. It's focused on what they can do for themselves. That's real, saints, because we can be the same way. We can shout on the resurrection. We can thank Jesus for taking our place and dying on the cross for us but we still out here trying to fix and figure and fight for positions and power in life because we think we got to do it ourselves Jesus says to us don't let this be you because this is not who I am and if you follow me this is not who you can be Therefore, he raised the contrast between who his disciples are to be and the reality of what we see in the world. For we cannot be envious of the world's ways and seek to say that we're living for our Lord. Where we put our trust in him, how we've come to know him and experience him, not as the promise, but through him, the promises of God that are revealed to us, then our manner cannot be like what we see. I know what we see in the world right now. And I know what you're thinking at times that if, uh, if, if he can be convicted of felonies yet get to the highest office in the land and have these erased from his life, perhaps there should be something that'll happen for some black brothers that are still incarcerated dealing with the things they have to deal with and they can't get off on their charges. So how can he? I, I, I know it, it has to hurt because there's some mothers who wish their babies could come home, but their babies got to do their time. But the one who's out there talking about he's going to help women deal with what they deal with in their bodies and make decisions for them is in the highest office in the land trying to tell our women what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. It has to pain us. It has to challenge us. But we can't allow ourselves to be like what we see because that's not who Jesus calls us to be. 
I ain't get as many amens on that. But I need you to know that this is the truth of the word of God. And this ain't my truth, but I got to live it just like you do. And if we trust who Jesus is for us, we can live like he lived. We can walk like he walked. We can serve like he served and not allow ourselves to be consumed by what's taking place in Washington, D.C. What's all over the news that's getting our attention and say, no, I'm going to take Jesus' cues and not allow myself to behave in some conduct that takes me far from him. Because if it had not been for him, I would not be who I am today. Say, we got to live this out because there are generations that are present and those yet to come into this world who will wonder if they should forego morals and values, if they should lose a lack of character that we tell them about having, about telling the truth, about being honest, about being responsible and accountable. They need to know that we still need to live these out. Regardless of what we hear and see in this world. And even more, right now, we ourselves need to hear from Jesus. We need to hear from Jesus because in spite of the way things appear to us, regardless of what is soon to become our reality, we must continually serve though we suffer through our surrender because it's through our surrender that we find our true strength. See, you thought you were strong in yourself. You thought you could handle something. But now we're in a season where the only strength we're going to realize and recognize that makes us able to stand. The only strength that's going to be able to help us endure what we're going to experience and what we may encounter is going to be the strength that comes through our surrender. And I need some saints that's willing to say, I'm going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to let go of trying to handle this my way because if it had not been for Jesus, I wouldn't be saved. I wouldn't have the life I have and if he helped me get this far by faith I know he can lead me on and I'd rather his character be evident in me rather than the character of this world that people think getting them somewhere but they ain't going nowhere no time soon because they don't have the true power that Jesus gives and if Jesus can give me enough power to deal with life as it's coming at me fast I can trust that he's going to help me stand on this thing and get through these four years because I'm not going to let anything else be me but Jesus being for me. He said, don't let this be you. And if you're not going to let this be you, that means you have to trust that as a servant, which Jesus calls us to be, we must share in Christ's sufferings. As servants, we must share in Christ's sufferings. See, what we believe that we are able to handle in life will always humble us, yet it exalts Christ. What you think you can handle on your own, it's going to humble you, but it's going to exalt Christ. See, see, we have these tendencies that arise in us to try to prove our ability to handle things that are greater than us. We, we have these moments where we want to try to show ourselves mighty, show ourselves strong within ourselves to deal with some of the things that come up in life that we believe if we can prove it, others will believe that we are better than what we think we are. Sure, you, you, you've dealt with some pain in your life. Some of you have dealt with some issues or issues. Some have had struggles. Some have had heartbreaks and heartaches, and you made it out all right. And I thank God you made it out all right. I praise that you made it all right. However, there are some shared sufferings that we have with Christ that you and I have not yet been confronted with. Some shared sufferings. See, we thought that when we followed Jesus that it was going to be easy street. No, that some shared sufferings that we're going to experience. Some things that we're going to experience along with Jesus and Jesus with us. See, Jesus responds to James and John in the text who have this request they made of Jesus to do what they asked to give them seats at the right or the left and Jesus responds to them with a question asking them can you drink from the cup and can you be baptized 
with my baptism. And both of them were quick to say, yeah, we can handle it. Ain't that like us? Jesus, I got this. Jesus, I can do this on my, I, I, I'll take this one on. There, there's some things that we would suggest of ourselves to Jesus that we can handle. And we are speaking sometimes too fast before we take time to think about what we say. I, I know I'm telling the truth right there because the text helps us to see it. But at the same time, I know it for myself. And I ain't got scared to tell you that there's some time where I thought I could do some things that Jesus was telling me were going to be for me in life. And I thought I could handle them all by myself. Uh-huh. I'll be that transparent because I hope that my transparency will help you come to the place where you testify you had the same thing too. You thought you could handle that marriage all by yourself. Thought you could handle raising them kids all by yourself. You thought you could handle the craziness on that job where you got that promotion, and now you got people under you that they used to walk with, and you heard how nasty they treated the last boss, and now you the boss. You thought you could handle some things on your own. Spoke too soon, didn't you? When we speak too soon, sometimes, say some God, we can find ourselves speaking out of turn. Speaking out of our own want to prove, and to show, and to serve, to tell other people that we deserve what we want. But it's strange to me because just like the disciples in the text, we speak sooner than some things that even Christ had not yet experienced. The, the disciples, they said they could drink the cup he would drink. They said that they could be baptized with the baptism that he would be baptized with. But Jesus hadn't even experienced his own Gethsemane moment yet. <laughs> he, he hadn't gone to the garden where he prayed, where the blood, the, the, the sweat dripped from his head that looked like great drops of blood. He had not had the moment where he said, Father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, your will, not, your will but my, your, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus hadn't even gotten to that yet, but they're telling Jesus that they can handle some things that Jesus hadn't even endured yet. Isn't that crazy? That we can be so far outspoken in ourselves, so, 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 so confident in ourselves that we can handle some things that yet Jesus hadn't even experienced yet? And this grips our attention because if, if Jesus would go through this, how, how can two disciples... All of us, then we can handle what suffering is going to bring our way. Yes, you've been through some things, saints. But that don't mean you're going to be able to handle everything. And there's some things that are going to come our way that we're going to have to learn that, that if we're to endure them, if we're going to learn that we're able to make it through them, that we're going to have to trust that Jesus is the only one who can get us through our storms, see us through our valleys, help us to take on the sufferings based on our relationship with him. See, the trials and tribulations that we've yet to face are on their way, but we can be encouraged because we don't face these times alone. We don't go through this by ourselves. We have Jesus who has gone before us and his going before us allows us to know that if he can make it through this and we are in him, there's nothing that will come against us that we cannot make it through, we cannot overcome, we cannot be a great more than conquerors because of, because Jesus will see us through our sufferings if we'll walk with him. Je Jesus was burdened. He was condemned because of sin that he took up on our behalf. And this reminds us that what we share of suffering with Jesus, that he also shares in it with you and I. And this is what he shares with us that humbles us. Because you ought to know without a shadow of a doubt that you and I could not make it without him. We could not make it without him. We could not be who we are without him. We could not continue to go on in this life without Jesus. 
And I'm so glad to know that where we can testify that the truth be told by each of us that we have come this far by faith leaning on the Lord that it was because of him and the debt he paid for us that delivered us not only from sin but also from oppression and those who engage in conduct that is oppressive towards us that we are going to be all right because Jesus promised never to leave us alone. said he won't leave you nor forsake you but I like the way Peter who is a major source for Mark's gospel says it he says beloved do not be surprised at the fiery trials when they come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you but rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Can I help you shout right there? See, you thought that these things that are happening right now were something that should not have ever happened in your life. But you shouldn't be surprised. Can I tell you why we shouldn't be surprised? Because we saw this behavior about eight years ago in our land. We saw how people conducted themselves then. So eight years later, here we are again with the same situation, the same government leadership, the same type of things going on. And we should not be caught by surprise. But we ought to rejoice because though these trials come on every hand, we are not in strange times that are unfamiliar to Jesus who shares a suffering with us so we can rejoice that we are not in this alone. And when the hymn writer tells us that no, never alone, no, never alone, that he promised never to leave us, never to leave us again, we all ought to realize that you might feel like this is it. You might feel like all is over but the rent. But I'm here to testify to you today that these shared sufferings of Jesus will humble us so that we can lift him up. That we can exalt him and praise him and honor him for who he is. Because as long as we've got Jesus on our side, we're going to be all right and we will come through this. You might cry some days, you might feel down some days, but you can get upset. This is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in this. Why? Because Jesus is in this thing with me. He's in it with you. And I'm so glad to know he's in it with us because we don't have to find ourselves in a postural position where we are given to a place where we suffer all by ourselves. But Jesus suffers with us. Not only does Jesus suffer with us as servants, and we share the suffering with him, we also know that as servants, we then must surrender our safeguards. You got to surrender your safeguards. Walk with me. I know this is a lot, but I, I pray you'll get this. It's going to help us on the other side. See, often the attitudes and behaviors that are disagreed with by us, we sometimes will justify in ourselves when and where they appear to be beneficial to us. The attitudes that people have and the behaviors that although we know they are wrong, we sometimes will say, hmm, perhaps this might be what I need to do because it seems like it's going to help me get what I want. See, especially when those behaviors, those attitudes appear powerful enough to offer some sense of security to those who operate in them. Hmm. Those who attempt to establish their own allegiances appoint those who validate them and their agendas, which seems to work well for them. So why not? Seek to dictate these things for our own lives because by them we can determine our own destiny. After all, they seem to be above the law and nothing seems as if it will stop them now. But when we see this being the reality both in text and in our land, Jesus warns us about this becoming our conduct. For see, when we see those who lord it over and those who exercise authority over others, their pursuits of self-preservation 
by serving their own self-interest will always disagree with who Jesus calls us to be. I know that it looks like they got it all together. They got the plan laid out. They, they, they got their, their project they want to work to try to set us back. They, they think that they got the idea, the right way to make America great again. Hmm. But we can't allow then that behavior and attitudes to become us because we allow fear to seize us. We, we can't allow what they do and what they're pushing or what they think is best for them and not for all to become an anger that consumes us. We can't allow the pride that they demonstrate to become a pride that we then take on to exalt ourselves and causing us to become conformed to the world rather than becoming more like Christ. See, his call says, his call for us tells us that greatness has nothing to do with how you control or manipulate others with power that you assume you have. Because see, that's the power that corrupts absolutely. Jesus says, the way you find true greatness is when you become the servant of others and slave to all. Now, let me catch because I got some, my younger generation who will roll with me and know that just like I read those words in the text, they probably got a problem with that word slave too. Especially as we've heard in our present context through text messages sent through college students and high school students who received it talking about meet me for, to get your ride to a plantation. That word slave can trouble us. Therefore, we got to understand it in the context of Jesus suffering and is preparing us as disciples for ministry beyond where we are right now. See, what Jesus is presenting to us, saints, is to, that in order to counter the worldly leadership that seeks to serve itself and what it declares of what they think is great, Jesus says the only way you can handle that is if you take on my kingdom values, which truly will lead to you to greatness. Here's why. See, the, the true impact of being a servant, and even more a slave to all, is to live a life that is not self-centered, but other-centered. Uh-huh. See, you can't be so determined and focused on you that you can't do nothing for anybody else. That's why even we learn from Jesus, he gives us the commandments, he says, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. And if we can get some neighborly love amongst us, do it show and prove how much we love ourselves because we realize that when we're not so focused on us, when all things ain't got to be about what we want and how we want it, we can trust and know that we are called not to serve ourselves, but to serve one another. And it's through that service, saints, that we come to realize that as we serve others, we serve our Savior. James and John and the other ten were in danger of becoming like those they despise. And so are you and I if we become so consumed with ourselves that we cannot serve others. We can become so consumed by ourselves to think that even in these times we've got to hoard and hold on and, and keep back and put away so much because we're afraid of what's to come. No, Jesus said, don't live in such a mindset of fear that you serve yourself because that's what they do out there. They're trying to control people. They're trying to keep people in their place. They're trying to check others because they're trying to preserve themselves. But why must you preserve yourself when I've already saved you as secured you, not just now, but for an eternal future. Jesus says, you got to trust me and walk with me and know that I'm able to keep you when the world is against you. I'm able to help you when it says the world's going to hurt you. Trust and know that you don't have to give in to fear, doubt, anger, resentment, envy, or slander. Instead, cry out to Jesus, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Do I have these saints that are surrender all on this morning? Stop trying to hold on and take care of you and know that Jesus knows and cares for you. Not only must we relinquish 
get let go of our safeguards, things we think we gotta do to protect ourselves because we're in Christ. He's a keeper. Ah, I got some saints that know I'm talking about. If you know he's a keeper, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Oh, yes, he is. Shout right there. <laughs> Because he keeps us, we don't have to hold our safeguards. We ain't got to be focused on ourselves and trying to keep ourselves because he's always keeping us. And that makes it a clear path for us then to strive in every way to meet Christ's standards. See, see Jesus never lived a life in which he exempted himself from what he taught. You, you can pretty much say of Jesus, he practiced what he preached. He, he forgave others. He loved his enemies. He showed mercy. He lived these things out completely, setting forth a standard that he calls us to live. Mm -hmm. However, when we seek to live our lives in the way of his life, it means that we must not consider any other standard but him because that's the only way you can get his life is if you let him be the standard for your life see see both the sons of Zebedee eventually got this and John even declared it in 1 John 3 16 in which he says by this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we are to lay down our lives for one another. John got it. But he didn't get it right away. And I need you to give yourself some grace. Because if you're not going to let this be you, perhaps you haven't gotten to that place fully where you know how to lay down your life. It's a process. Because on the other side of salvation, you just don't lay down your life. You still hold on to some things. You still have some struggles, some issues, some things that you have not yet confessed and let go of freely so that you can live in the standard of Jesus. Knowing, though, the standard that Jesus is and living up to him releases us from the bondage that we can find ourselves still in because we're trying to measure up to those who think because they're in power now that they're all powerful. Jesus delivers us, saints, from worry that if things don't happen the way we believe they should, that we don't find ourselves thinking that all hope is lost. Instead, Jesus, by his standard, directs us towards his surrender. And this is what sets us free. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And therefore, when we look to him who is our standard, we as standard bearers trust that in Jesus, we have come to know ourselves and can lead others to also see themselves for who they truly are. To know then our weaknesses, our vulnerabilities, and our vices. To realize our own wants for power and control. And that we sometimes want every situation we're in to be in our favor and to get what we want. But that's not just the way things go. I know, I know, I know you ain't going to shout on that. Because we holler, favor, church running. Favor over you, favor me, favor my bank account. We shout over that. But everything don't work in our favor. But that don't mean we lessen our standard. Because the standard of Jesus is so much greater than us that we can keep growing up and maturing in him that we should not become frustrated when things don't happen the way we thought they would. We don't get so caught up in ourselves to be consumed by trying to figure out who didn't vote and who did vote. 
But instead, we turn ourselves again to Jesus and say, we're going to trust you so that we can show others compassion, that we can continue to walk in this thing called faith, that mercy and love be abundant in us, and it gives us no room for our own petty plays for power because we know the one who has all power in his hands. There's no greater standard than Jesus and when we live to the standard of him, we do not lose. We gain. We, we gain more patience. We gain more understanding. We gain greater faith. We gain greater hope. We gain greater joy. And this joy that we have the world didn't give, and the world can't take it away. And I don't know about you, but I feel good right there because in the midst of where we are in the world, we need some joy. We need some joy to help us know that he gives us what is juxtaposed to the junk that we see all over television. We need some joy to let us know that we can meet each day with the assurance that he will lead and guide us all the way. We need some joy that I get us to clap in our hands and tap in our feet and sing songs of praise. We need some joy that I get us into a position of interceding for others and calling on the name of Jesus. Because we know that when we call on that great name, demons tremble at his name. Things change at his name. We don't have life as we know it. We have life as he gives it because we have Jesus' joy. Do I have any saints that know about the joy of Jesus and all that it blesses us to have in our lives? Oh, it's his joy that he gives that we gain when we live to the standard that he is. I, I, I'm not closing yet, but, but I'm almost there. Is he great? I, 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 I got to... Joy just gets good in my spirit. Joy puts a smile on my face. Joy warms my heart. Joy renews my spirit. Joy shifts my mind. Joy lifts my hands. Joy gives me something to tell others about Jesus. Joy makes me so feel so good. Joy does so much in my life. I don't know about you, but right now this joy moment has got me. It has taken a hold of me to know that I'm going to hold to this joy I have because I know who gave it to me. And as long as he keeps giving to me, I'm going to keep living for the one who makes me glad. Yeah. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. <sighs> mm. <sighs> I got one more for you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Here's why that matters. Here's why that matters. And I'm not going to give you the long quote. I'm going to give you the simple quote from Gregory Nazanius, a monk and theologian. He says, let us become like Christ since Christ became like us. Let us become gods for his sake since he for ours became man. He assumed the worse that he might give us the better. He became poor that through his poverty we might become rich. He took upon himself the form of a servant that we might receive back our liberty. And he came down that we might be exalted in him. He was tempted that we might conquer he was dishonored that he might glorify us. He died that he might save us. And it's his saving work for me that causes me to refuse to live life by any other standard than the one he set. It's his dying that gives us life 
that assures me that in this life, although we have trouble, we can take heart because he's already overcome the world. And I'm so glad to know that we, we serve a Jesus who's already overcome the world and has already taken on death, hell, and the grave, that we ain't going to worry about those things, but we can keep living for him. And as Paul says, we can have this mind in ourselves, which also is ours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held tightly, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the life likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him that name that is above every name. Now, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, even in all of Washington, D.C., and every tongue to confess on earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do I have any saints that know that he is Lord? He is Lord. He has risen from the dead, and he is Lord. And because of the standard that our Lord has set for us, we don't have to become troubled because of what we see. We don't have to become down because of what's going on. We can keep on knowing that it's a day coming when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. I know they saying all kinds of lies. I know they're talking all kind of crazy talk, but don't you worry because every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that he is Lord. And as long as he is Lord, as long as he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we don't to be like this world because we have one better than the world who's already overcome it for you and I. Give God praise. Don't you be like this. <laughs> Don't you be like this. Know the sufferings that we share in with him that we don't go through this alone. Stop trying to create safeguards and secure yourself because he's already achieved eternal security for you and I. Trust and know that we can strive to live to a standard that evidences that he still reigns. And as long as he reigns, we don't have to worry about those who try to set up their rule on the earth because their rule is never greater than his reign. So when you see something on the news or you hear something on the radio that sounds crazy, just say, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. When you see them red hats in the street, say, every knee must bow, every tongue confess. When people on your job start talking crazy, every knee must bow, every tongue confess. It's a day that's coming and they can't stop it because Jesus has already suffered for it and God has declared it. And I'm so glad to know that trouble won't last always gives me joy. See, I'm back there again. And that's what makes me happy enough to say that I'm not worried about tomorrow because I know the one who holds it. I know the one who will make a way. I know the one who already worked all things out that we can know that it's going to be okay. Don't you get down on yourself. Don't you get lost in this thing because we are better than this. Church, we've seen this before. <laughs> we are like this is his first time in office. We saw how he did then, so we know how things gonna go now. And don't you be caught by surprise. Because these are just trials we face. But these trials only come to make us strong. And, and here's the good news about See, it's not to make you strong in your strength, but to be strengthened in Him. <sighs> hmm, thank you, Holy Spirit. Sometimes God gives you some illustrations in your day-to-day -day life, and I was going to say because I thought I would use it some other time, but it works right here. See, I, I, y'all heard me talk about my brother TJ who, who trains people at the gym. 
The other day I went to the gym and TJ had these folks doing this exercise. And I said, what in the world do you have these people doing? And whatever you got them doing, it's like you just sit at home and create stuff for them to do. TJ looked back at me and said, no. He said, everything I give them to do, it has a purpose. He said, it's to help build them up so that they can be stronger for the days to come. Don't you think a trial is here because God didn't have nothing else to do? God, God just wanted to give you something to deal with. No, God allows these trials to happen because there's a purpose in them. He's trying to prepare us for what's to come. So don't you become troubled. Don't you get discouraged. Don't you get down on yourself when you face these trials. But count it all joy. <laughs> Because they're going to come. But he assures us that they have a purpose in our lives. We're going to be all right, church. We're going to get closer. We're going to become the disciples we're called to be. We're going to build community. And we're going to help one another and care for each other the way Jesus has set a standard forth for us to do. The great standard of him we strive for. The great standard of him we yearn for. The great standard of him we believe on him for to be evident in our lives in every way we glorify him. Perhaps you're here today and You've been worshiping with us. You've been coming Sunday after Sunday and you've been hearing the word and you've been being nudged at, being wrestled with by the Spirit to lead you to a place where you come to your own faith, to where you come to a place where I say, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I, I need him in my life because I've been trying to live a standard of other people and their standards keep changing. I, I got so many safeguards, I'm afraid to let them go because I feel like if I let them go, I won't know who I am. I'm suffering, but I feel like I'm suffering all alone. I, I need some help. Receive Christ today. For John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. And all you got to do is what Romans 10 and 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised his son from the dead, you shall be saved. So we offer Christ today. Won't you come receive Christ? And if you don't have a church home, you don't have a community of faith where you're partnered to help you grow, to walk with others who are trusting in Jesus, seeking and striving to live the standard of him, we offer you to join with us here. If you're virtual, join with us, partner with us, and let's walk this faith thing out together. We're never called to walk this alone, but the community of believers that join together, trusting and believing in Jesus and all he is to us and for us. So as the praise team sings, we invite you to come, receive Christ, partner, and join with us here if you would grow. Jesus Christ is Lord, for he is Lord, he is Lord, he has risen from the dead and he is Lord, every knee shall bow, every knee, and every tongue Every 
you now to hear the reading of God's word and the prayer for the sacraments. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave to them saying, drink all of it, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Father God, we come before you right now. First and foremost, Father, we're going to say thank you for what you've done, what you are doing, and what you will do, God. But now, God, we come before you for this special time, Father. We come before you, God, to ask you to bless these sacraments, Father. We ask you to bless the bread which represents your body. We ask you to bless the wine, which represents the blood that you sacrificed for us, Father God, so that we may live free. Father, we ask all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. At this time, is there anyone who's been overlooked by the receiving of the bread and of the wine? If you raise your hand, our deacons will quickly come to you. Keep your hand raised for us. Was the blood save me? One day when I was lost. Jesus died on the cross, and I know it was the blood saved me. I said, I know it was the blood, know it. I said, I know it was the blood, know it was the blood saved me. One day when I was lost,
Jesus took the bread and broke it, gave it to the disciples. He said, I'll be in this bread. You do so in remembrance of me. Let us eat together. Likewise, he took the cup. He gave it to his disciples. He said, this cup represents the blood of my sacrifice for you. Let us drink together. As often as we do this, we do so in remembrance of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Showing forth his death and sacrifice for us. But we truly know it was the blood that saved us. Amen. And we'll go out singing that as our benediction. As our hymn as we go out. May God bless you. Preach your neighbor. Give him a hug and change his smile. And may God be with you. Have an amazing week. I know. Thank you for being a part of our worship service on today. Please take note of the following announcements and upcoming events. For more information about the Buell Grove Baptist Church, please check us out on YouTube and Facebook or visit our website at buellgrove.org.